Hello, everybody. So we're going to start right on time. Um, I just want to start off uh, by giving a huge thanks to everybody out there who's watching um, for taking the time to be with us. I'm thrilled to be part of this historic event. My name is Bianca Mageni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. First, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to be hearing from our speakers. And then um, we're going to be taking some questions from journalists. If there's time, we'll take a few audience questions as well. So first off, I want to let everyone know that there is a chat and we've posted a social media guide um, that you can uh, use to support our event in there. Um, also, you can follow uh, Foreign Policy's Twitter at Foreign Policy underscore C to support this event. Um, and just please share that this is happening live um, to your Facebook and so that your friends who haven't registered uh, can watch at facebook.com slash CDN Dimension. Um, so we don't have the bandwidth to sort of monitor the comments. So just asking you, imploring you to please just keep them very civil. Um, we know there's a lot of varied opinions on this topic and we support people's prerogative to express themselves. That's great. But we just, uh, we just ask that you engage in civil discourse. So before handing it over to our guests, Roger Waters and Foreign Minister uh, Jorge Ariaza, I want to thank the people who made this event possible. Um, we're so grateful to our co-sponsors, Common Frontiers, who did a lot of media work and have done so much to promote this event. Um, we'd like to thank the Canadian Latin America Alliance. We're doing all the background tech work right now um, to, to get this to you all in your homes. Special shout out to our media um, sponsor, Canadian Dimension, who are also live streaming this event. Um, so please find out more about these terrific groups and the work that they're doing. Um, I also just want to thank the many groups who've endorsed this event. Um, there's lots of you, the Canada Files, the Ottawa Peace Council, the Canada Network on Cuba, Table de Consultation de Solidarité Québec Cuba, the Louis Riel Bolivarian Circle, Socialist Action, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, Alba Canada Ottawa, ILPS Ottawa, the Anti-Imperialist Alliance, Hands Off Latin America Saskatoon, Frente Hugo Chavez, Para la Defensa de los Pueblos, Vancouver, the Regina Peace Council and the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. So the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is, is a newly launched organization. And uh, our role is to challenge unjust foreign policy measures and bridging the gap between the perception and the reality of Canada's role in the world. So in terms of our work, uh, Canada portrays itself as a benevolent actor on the international stage, but the facts often show otherwise. And uh, our institute recently spearheaded a campaign to urge UN member states to vote no to Canada's bid for a Security Council seat. And among numerous issues that we highlighted, we criticized Canada's role in Venezuela. And our widely circulated open letter noted, the Trudeau government has led efforts to unseat Venezuela's UN recognized government while propping up repressive, corrupt and illegitimate governments in Haiti and Honduras. Uh, so Canada ultimately lost the UN bid and, and quite badly. And given its international track record, this shouldn't have come as a big surprise. And it's in moments like these, um, and we do events like this, because it's a moment for us to reflect upon and demand a really serious major shift in Canadian foreign policy. So questioning our policy towards Venezuela is also part of an open letter that we launched um, as the Institute calling for a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy. So we released this following um, the second consecutive UN Security uh, Council defeat. This has been signed by nearly 50 groups, including groups like Greenpeace Canada, 350 Canada, I Don't Know More, um, as, well by, as well as by Canadians like David Suzuki, Naomi Klein, Stephen Lewis, uh, four sitting MPs signed on to this call and numerous former MPs. And one of the 10 questions um, that we ask for, uh, for a, fo a foreign policy reset is, why is Canada involved in efforts to overthrow Venezuela's UN recognized government, a clear violation of the principle of non-intervention in other countries' internal affairs? So there's a growing appetite to challenge Canadian foreign policy. Last week, we organized an event on Bolivia and Canada's role, and one of the participants, uh, a new NDP MP, Matthew Green, declared, we ought not be part of a pseudo-imperialist group like the Lima Group. So there's growing questioning of Canada's brazen campaign to oust Venezuela's government. And we know that Canada are founders of the anti-Maduro Lima Group Coalition with Peru. With Peru. Um, Canadian officials claim to be promoting democracy and human rights in Venezuela. So why are we acting in lockstep with the US? 
The damage caused by the US sanctions to Venezuela's economy and health are immense. This is death, this is starvation. And yet Canada has added to this, further squeezing Venezuela's economy. Um, and we've imposed four rounds of unilateral sanctions on Venezuelan officials. And all of this happening during a time of COVID. And we also know that Canada has played a critical role in building international diplomatic support for self-proclaimed President Juan Guaido. So our country continues to uh, aggressively support him. As Canadians, we have to ask ourselves, what does this have to do with democracy? And the Institute believes that these are failed policies that don't represent the will of Canadians to be a force for peace and human rights in the world. And, um, and I could go on, <laughs> but uh, I doubt anyone tuned in to hear me. So on that note, it gives me great pleasure to hand over the floor to our first guest who helped greatly in our campaign to, um, you know, to, to defeat Canada's bid for security council seat, a tireless and brave advocate for human rights. And I've heard he's a pretty good musician too. Um, co-founder of Pink Floyd, Roger Waters. Welcome, Roger. Hey, Blanca. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was extremely eloquent and, um, and, and informative. Had I not been involved in, in some of the issues that you speak about in uh, Canadian politics recently, most of that would have been news to me. I was, as you say, um, somewhat involved in, in moves to prevent Canada from uh, obtaining uh, a seat on the Security Council um, on the grounds of its human rights records. And so the questions that you ask are questions that I might well have asked myself, but you've done that eloquently. I will repeat just one of them, which is, what really is Canada's interest in Venezuela, this country on the north of the South American continent, um, which is uh, um, set off uh, in recent years, certainly since 1998, uh, on a path towards a more um, equal um, future uh, after the Bolivarian Revolution, um, applauded hugely by everyone in the world who believes in democracy and who believes in the equitable split of resources uh, for the peoples that live in any sovereign country, and not just Venezuela. So, um, I'm so pleased to be able to join this. I know Jorge, um, we have broken bread together uh, in the past. I'm really, really interested to hear uh, what he has to say. Um, but just while I have the floor for a second, I want to also say hello to all my friends in the West Suetan movement and uh, uh, fighting the coastal pipeline there. That is also incredibly important, not just for the indigenous people, of, uh, of Canada, of the Western provinces, but for everyone, not just all the indigenous people in the world, but for all of us, this is a fight that we were all involved in. Fossil fuels, as we know, are killing us all, not slowly, they're killing us all really, really fast. So more power to you guys uh, in all of the good things that you're doing in Canada. And um, now, now I'm gonna shut up and uh, if I have to answer a question later, uh, I shall endeavour to do so. Um, I hope Richard Branson is watching this. I remember having a few words with him back in February uh, 2019 when he leapt onto this extraordinary bandwagon that developed overnight, as I recall, in the middle of February, where suddenly everyone in the world, including Bernie Sanders, I have to say, which was a huge shock and disappointment to me, suddenly went, oh, Guaido is now the president of uh, Venezuela. Well, who says so? Um, Elliot Abrams and Mike Pompeo and Donald Trump say so. So he is. So I'm, I really am gonna stop now, Jorge, and say, hey, I can't welcome you because you're in Venezuela, but um, it's so lovely that Blanca has welcomed us both to, the, to Canada, which is a great country with a huge tradition of protest. And where, by the way, the majority of the people hold the same philosophical and political positions that Blanca does. It's really the, a narrow front of the, of the government that supports the Lima Group and so on. So I'm listening, brother. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, and we're obviously very glad the Canadians could bring, uh, you know, 
more of this to your attention. It's so great to hear your perspective and, uh, and also to just hear the encouragement for us to, to see all of ourselves as part of the struggle. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the Venezuelan Foreign Minister, Jorge Ariaza. Um, he has held several important positions in the current Venezuelan government, uh, as well as in the government of President Hugo Chavez, who was vice president of Venezuela from 2013 to 2016. And he was simultaneously area vice president for the social development and revolution of the missions, as well as the minister of university education, science and technology from 2016 to 2017. He was appointed foreign minister in 2017. Welcome to the foreign minister. Thank you so much. I, I'm really glad and honored to be here and to have this unusual opportunity to share and to exchange our vision and opinions with the people of Canada. As a minister of foreign affairs, but I must say in Venezuela, we are ministers of the popular power of foreign affairs or any other ministry. And uh, we usually meet or talk to the governments, to the people that rule. But in this opportunity, I have this gift from life and I can talk to the real heart of Canada directly to your people, and that is important. I, I must greet all the social movements from Canada and from other places that have connected with this conference. And thank you, Blanca. You, Blanca said at the beginning, as Roger said, you were very eloquent and you really gave important information uh, to put us in context. And Roger, my brother, thank you for your solidarity always and especially for understanding the Bolivarian Revolution and many processes in Latin America that we always find difficult to explain because of this blockade um, of the media and, and uh, all the sources of information. But uh, Roger Waters has always understood and has shared with us our struggle, our victories, our defeats, and uh, that's why I'm really honored for him to be here. And I know he wants to have more information and he always asks for more information about Venezuela. And he probably will at least sing something, a uh, part of a song or play something at the end. So we must say that the diplomatic relationship between Venezuela and Canada historically was pretty smooth and uh, stable. Huh? Before the Bolivarian Revolution, it was mainly diplomatic. And after the Bolivarian Revolution, it even became um, more close. And we had many um, business exchanges for investment, for Canadian investment in Venezuela. We had companies that uh, uh, came to Venezuela, worked in Venezuela, and uh, it was a better time for our relation. But suddenly, something happened in 2016 and uh, if you remember 2016 is the year of the election of donald trump but especially everything happened in 2017 trump was already in office and there was a radical change of attitude of behavior from the canadian government against the venezuelan government so somehow, especially through the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Christia Freeland, um, she began to question everything about Venezuela. And covered by this umbrella, by this mask of the defense of human rights, they began to intervene to every, every single day there was a, a different interference of Canada in our internal affairs. They promoted political violence. 2017 was a difficult year for Venezuela. And when President Maduro found a way out, which was not repression with the military, which could have been the solution or a solution in 48 hours. But after four months of daily demonstrations, um, violent demonstrations, people dying, 
because the opposition in some parts of, of our main cities had control of the streets, these so-called guarimbas and blocking the streets in Venezuela. Um, when President Maduro find a democratic solution, which was conveying to Venezuelan people to vote to elect a um, national constituent assembly, which is a figured, very democratic, the most pure figure of this constitution, then Canada, but especially after the United States said so, decided to, in advance, not to recognize the election of the National Constituent Assembly. And then after the, this election, which was difficult, but I must say the last day of demonstrations, the last day that a Venezuelan died during these riots, the last day where uh, public buildings were uh, set on fire and they even destroyed some um, voting stations all over the country was the day of the election. When the opposition and the um, White House witnessed that more than 8 million Venezuelans went out to vote, they decided, you know, they realized what they had done and they couldn't even um, uh, gather 20 people anymore in the streets. So it was a democratic victory for the Venezuelan people. Then we had elections for the governors you know, in the states of Venezuela and we won 19 out of 23 states. Then we had elections for the mayors, the municipalities and we won 308 out of 335. And Canada didn't recognize the results of these elections. And I must say that especially the elections of the governors of the states, all the opposition participated. But they said in advance it was going to be, there was going to be fraud during these elections. So we were really surprised. Why was Canada following the steps of the United States? Why was Canada, Canada even taking um, the blows, uh, putting the, their face to say things that the United States, because of the very bad reputation they have in the Latin American countries, couldn't say. So Canada began to be in the front line of the aggression against Venezuela. And we had, we had really no idea what was happening. Why Canada? It, we always saw Canada as a, as a bridge, as, a, as, a, as an actor that with whom we could establish dialogue and search for dialogue with the United States and other, uh, even other parts of the world. But it was not the case. And always using the liberal framework of the defense of human rights. So you know that Prime Minister of Canada, um, Mr. Trudeau has had, is nothing like his father, I must say. And he has had some differences with the Trump administration, especially the climate change, trade agreements, etc. And uh, I, what we really believe and conclude is that they had these important differences. So Venezuela was an easy card to agree among, upon. So that's what they did. They said, okay, we have this, uh, fights, but let's agree about Venezuela. We will do what you can't do. Let us organize the Grupo de Lima, the Lima Group. No, it won't be you directly, Mr. Pompeo. It's going to be Christia, it's going to be Trudeau. It's, it's going to be easier if we do it this way. Because if the United States is a member of the Grupo de Lima, no one is going to give any credibility to this group because they will believe that it is the United States with, it, with its regime change policy trying to attack Venezuela. And uh, we also must say that there is a second um, reason or mo motivation that produces this aggression from Canada against Venezuela. It's, it is related to the oil interests, you know, these big companies in Alberta, you know, this, this state of, of, of Canada where you produce heavy oil, just like Venezuelan oil, 
heavy oil and the refineries, especially in the south of the United States, in Texas, in Florida, Florida and, and other parts, are designed for the Venezuelan oil, for heavy oil, because traditionally it was Venezuela that supplied this petroleum, this oil to these refineries. And now, because of this um, aggression against Venezuela, because of these sanctions against Venezuela, the, the oil from Canada is substituting the one that uh, the oil from Venezuela. So there was a clear interest, but there was all, also some uh, um, interest from some companies like Crystalex, which was a mining company in Venezuela that, how do you say, it's a, uh, like, like a fake company, which never existed really because it was, its name is Crystalex because it was created for a, a region in Venezuela where the important gold mines called Cristinas. So it was Crystalex. And uh, they had a lot of uh, struggles and, and, and uh, fights with uh, the miners in Venezuela, the, the, the small miner in Venezuela. And uh, they really, they, they didn't make a, an important investment. But at some point, Presidente Chavez decided to nationalize all the gold industries and these companies were asked to leave Venezuela. So they went to an arbitration process and uh, suddenly during these last years, we lost this arbitration process. And uh, that money that the Republic of Venezuela, the, Rep the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela owned, owes that has to pay well, um, it should be to this Crystal X so-called company. But it is related to Canada, it's Canadian, and they have links with this uh, member of parliament, Juan Guaido. I must say that nobody knew Juan Guaido before he raised his hand in the middle of a demonstration in the street and uh, self-proclaimed as uh, president of our country. And many Venezuelans have forgotten his name. They, with some difficulty, they learned to write to the, the spelling of his name and now they have uh, even forgotten it. So all this um, business interest came into, into this new chess game and Canada was in the vanguard of this aggression against Venezuela. We must remember that this Grupo de Lima, this Lima group, was created because the United States didn't um, manage to have all the votes they needed to in, in the OAS, in the Organization of the American States, in order to expel Venezuela or to apply the Democratic Charter of the Americas and intervene Venezuela, especially because they couldn't convince the ALBA countries and the countries of the CARICOM, the Caribbean nations. They never had the 24 votes they needed, so they even didn't have the 18 votes at the beginning, so they created this Lima group, which is an informal group. It is not legal. It's not registered in, in, in any international organization, and it meets to attack Venezuela. And it's usually, well, the, the chair of this group is, is Peru, usually, but that's formal. The real orders and instructions are given by Canada, but especially from the US, from Washington to Canada, to the group of Lima. And one of, in the last meetings they have had, they have even uh, um, connected with video conferences with Pompeo and the United States is not a member of the group and Pompeo tells them what to do. Um, and, and in the terms of the, of the agreements that they signed at the end of this. And this group of Lima has for them, this constitution doesn't exist. They can appoint the president of Venezuela. They can tell uh, which countries have to block Venezuela. They can sanction all the Venezuelans. They can uh, say anything about the Venezuelan internal issues. They can even create the conditions to attack Venezuela. Because I must say, and that is 
something that goes against the human rights and against the peace policy of Canada, they have even tried to activate the Rio Treaty. The Rio Treaty, which is a treaty signed by some of the states of the Americas, was uh, initially signed in 1955, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken. And the spirit of this treaty, which is a military treaty, a defense treaty, is to help one another, the countries of Latin America, of the Americas, from Canada to Argentina and Chile, um, when there is an extra continental actor that is going to um, uh, get in, wage a war against one of our of the member states. So it, it, in 1982, if you remember the war of the Malvinas, or the Falklands, like the British say, and uh, Argentina tried to invoke the, the Rio Treaty. And the United States supported the Great Britain, the United Kingdom, and not Argentina. So this treaty really had no sense. It was uh, never really enforced. It was never used formally. But since 2018, they have been gathering, doing these meetings, and uh, taking some steps. And Canada has been in the center of these events. And this means that they want to create the conditions in order to attack Venezuela, to invade Venezuela, because they want to take control of our country and its wealth, the, its natural resources. And, its, and of course, they want to um, eliminate the ideology of our government, of our people, I must say, which comes since our indigenous people who believed in the, in the collective uh, property, um, what is the property? Oh, the property, and uh, who believed that things could be done different, but also has a lot to do with all our history, with socialism, but it's our socialism, it's not the Cuban socialism, it's not the Chinese socialism, it's not the Vietnamese socialism, it's the Venezuelan socialism. It's democratic, it has elections, it has uh, many political parties from the extreme left to the extreme right. And it is our right to establish our own political system. It's enshrined here in the Charter of the United Nations, which Canada and the United States, but we are talking about Canada, is violating uh, since at least 2016, 17, when it comes to Venezuela. So here we are. Um, and then in 2019, there, there was a plan which was not decided in, in 2019. It was discussed in the Grupo de Lima and in other um, groups and, and uh, instances, and it was launched in 2019, but it really began in 2018, you know, during the la December 2017 and February 2018, there was a political dialogue process in Dominican Republic. The host was the president of Dominican Republic. Former president of Spain, Rodriguez Zapatero, was there. And the right wing opposition and the Venezuelan government sat and we um, agreed on many topics. And we had the agreement already printed. And the media was there the February, February 7th of 2018. And everything was set, and our delegation arrived with their pens in their hand to sign the agreement. And when the delegation of the opposition arrived, they said there was nothing to agree upon, there was nothing to sign, because they couldn't reach an agreement with the dictatorship, the tyrant, uh, Maduro, and all this um, narrative against uh, their own country. So what happened was that, that uh, it was that we kept on with the agreement uh, unilaterally. We went to the presidential elections, which were due to happen um, on, in 2018. And uh, this opposition, opposition didn't register for the elections. So President Maduro was almost um, alone. That's not what we wanted. There was an important candidate from the opposition, but he was not the best one. 
of them. He, uh, before he had been the chief of campaign of Enrique Capriles, the candidate uh, against uh, Comandante Chavez in 2012. So the traditional parties boycotted the elections. The European Union, the US, Canada, in advance, said that they wouldn't recognize the results of the elections. So this was a plan. It was activated at that same moment, uh, February the 7th. And they decided to not to recognize the Venezuelan constitution, the president that was going to be elected, but they had to wait until the 10th, uh, January the 10th, uh, when this constitution sets the inauguration of uh, the government that was elected the year before. And President Maduro was, was sworn as president and uh, formally, and uh, he became the president of the United States, elect, oh, sorry, of Venezuela, elected, but not recognized by the United States and other, or these other countries. And uh, at some point, uh, January the 23rd, this man, Guaido, went to a demonstration, raised his hand, declared himself, self-proclaimed himself as a president of Venezuela, and the plan was in place, was happening. We, at the beginning, it was ridiculous, and we even laughed, I must say. I said, this man is absolutely crazy. What is he doing? But then a new, um, uh, a new method of the international relations happened. The Twitter, Mr. Mike Pence tweeted, recognizing Guaido as the president of Venezuela. Then Mr. John Bolton, I almost don't even remember him well. And then Mr. Mike Pompeo, I'm talking the same day, the 23rd of January, and in, in the evening, Mr. Donald Trump. So that was the recognition that Guaido was looking for. And uh, it happened, it, that was the plan. Then in a couple of days after that, Canada recognized this man who nobody elected, nobody voted for him. And then the Europeans took a little long. Oh, Mr. Borrell, who was then the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain, said that the Americans convinced them that Maduro was already out of power. It was a matter of not weeks, but days. So they gave, they set an ultimatum, a deadline to the Venezuelan government. Maduro, if you don't call for new elections, then we are going to recognize Guaido. You have eight days. So eight days passed and they actually recognized Juan Guaido, expecting that Maduro was going to be overthrown and that Guaido was going to be in power in, in sooner or later that month. Of course, it never happened. We never thought it could even happen. When I met with Elliot Abrams in the, in the United Nations um, facilities for, for the first time, well, he, when we sat down, Carlos Rom was our, my vice minister who's here with me, was with me, Samuel Moncada, our, our representative to the UN was there. When we sat down, he almost said, let's negotiate the terms of your surrender, of your capitulation. Where is Maduro going to fly? Where is he? Is he going to go to Cuba, or to some Caribbean country? Uh, do you want to stay here in the United States? Um, you are a, an honest man. You're not corrupt. So we're going to protect your family here. Please come to the right side of history and all that. I, 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 I won't say the word that I'm thinking about. And when I told him, hey, Mr. Abrams, I think we are in a, this is a different meeting <laughs> because I'm here to tell you that we are not going to accept your interference in Venezuelan internal affairs and that you must stop. We want to have dialogue with you, but only if you respect us. And President Maduro has been elected um, last year, and he's going to be in office at least until 2025. Maybe he becomes our candidate again and he, even longer. So please respect our internal requirements. And he said no. So he thought it was going to be like a sprint, you know, a 100 meter sprint. And uh, I told him at the end of that meeting, Mr. Abrams, this might be a marathon. If you are going to keep on attacking Venezuela and trying, to impose this uh, fake government and this uh, regime change policy. This is going to be a marathon and we are experts. And Maduro is an expert when it comes to marathons. 
So he's, he laughed about it. But the next time we met, which was after this event that Roger was talking about, this so-called event and concert for the humanitarian aid for Venezuela that Canada supported, you know, and Mr. Branson organized and put a lot of money for this concert to happen. Well, after that, we met. And I told him, you see, Mr. Abrams, that nothing happened, that our military are uh, respecting our constitution and our government, and that uh, your coup, no, your coup d'etat failed. And he said, OK, if it failed, I must accept it, until, um, at least until now. Then we are going to apply the maximum pressure strategy. And we have a lot of allies. And in his list, Canada was always the first one to be mentioned. And we're going to press you. There are going to be sanctions. You're going to be almost uh, strangled. strangled. And your people are going to rebel against you and your military. Uh, if not, something else will happen, but you will not last in power. So think about it. Tell Maduro to resign and uh, all this is. I told him. He was absolutely um, out of uh, any real situation of, of the reality. So, but talking about uh, um, Canada again, you know, I'm, well, well, when, when these elections happened, which that was March, uh, which was April, what? That, uh, Maduro. May the 20th of May, 2018, the only, country in the world, the only government in the world that stopped, that forbid the Venezuelans from uh, voting in this election was the government of Canada. We were not authorized to install the voting stations, the voting centers in our consulates or in other facilities that you, you usually rent for these events. Uh, we didn't have the the permission of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Canada. So the Venezuelans that wanted for, to vote for Maduro or, or for Henry Falcon or for uh, the other candidates couldn't vote. No, the only Venezuelans in the world that didn't have the right to vote were the Venezuelans in Canada, living in Canada. So that, do you really support democracy? Avoiding the Venezuelans, forbidding the Venezuelans the right to vote, that's absolutely absurd. So you see the madness of this, of this policy against Venezuela. Then, of course, um, you already know that uh, um, Canada didn't recognize our government. They immediate, almost immediately recognized Guaido and uh, maybe who, know, who knows, because this interim government, which as we call the Narnia government. So Canada has been playing a role to try to impose a government in Venezuela in order to um, be able to steal, to rob our wealth. That's what they are doing. And that is what Guaido is doing. They. In, they had their own interpretation of this constitution in Canada, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They thought they could be above the Venezuelan constitution. They supported Guaido. And I must say that they did a lot of lobbying all over the world with their ambassadors, but especially in the Caribbean or Caribbean. The former ambassador to Venezuela, Cuba, I think it's his, his, his last name, traveled. Uh, from one country to the other, one island to the other, and lobbying, uh, trying to convince these countries, these governments, to de-recognize Maduro and to recognize this, this crazy man, Guaido. So that's something that really happened. And uh, I must say, um, for instance, in the, in the recent years, the Office of Protocol has come to the absurdity of requesting our diplomats to work with Guaido's illegal ambassador. There, there's, there's a man, what's his name? Vieira uh, Blanco. Vieira Blanco, a rich Venezuelan who used to tweet from his Porsche, no? his 
his car in Miami, he was appointed ambassador of the Narnia government to Canada. So they are telling our ambassador and our staff in our embassy in Ottawa to work for this man. That's what the protocol office of that ministry is trying to do. And I must say that um, this man is part of an NGO, the Canadian Venezuelan Engagement Foundation, who became, they became one of the first beneficiaries of the CITGO programs. CITGO, our company, our uh, um, energy company in Texas and in other parts of the US, it has more than, I believe, 2,000 gas stations all over the US, refineries. This was confiscated by the US. But CITGO used to pay for social programs, for health programs, for Venezuelans abroad in Italy, in Argentina, for very chronic and difficult diseases. So they stopped financing, funding these programs, and they began to give that money to these NGOs. One of them is the NGO of the so-called ambassador of one way to, to Canada. So this is unethical, really. It's immoral. It's something uh, really crazy. There are deep ties uh, from corporate Canada to this Narnia Guaido so-called government. Uh, the man who Guaido initially designated as alleged state attorney to litigate against Venezuela in foreign courts, Jose Ignacio Hernandez, and who has, who has to oversee Venezuelan interests, had previously worked for the private law firm and developed the legal justification for CITCO to be used to pay Crystalex. That's Crystalex, the mining company I told you at the beginning, at this arbitration award. Likewise, when Guaido went to Ottawa earlier this year, Scotia Bank representatives praised him and called him and called for supporting him against President Maduro. It's all about business. They want to control Venezuelan wealth. They want to control Venezuelan oil, Venezuelan gold, Venezuelan diamonds, Venezuelan coal, and Venezuelan bauxite, Venezuelan and iron and everything, and, and, and water and uh, bi bi biological diversity and, and everything. That is what they are doing. Well, let's talk about sanctions. The Canadian government is supposed to defend human rights. You know what really threatens and even impacts at, at, at the worst level the human rights in Venezuela or in Iran or Syria or Cuba or Mozambique and other countries? Sanctions. And Canada has sanctioned more Venezuelan officials than the US government, even more. But they have supported this policy of sanctions from the US, and they take their own sanctions, and they try to block any Canadian um, of, you know, for investing in Venezuela. So how can this be for the defense of the human rights of the Venezuelan people? How can this um, uh, contribute to a democratic solution uh, among the Venezuelans? That's all hypocrisy from this Canadian government. We would like to have respect from the Canadian government. We would have to have some respect from the government of the United States. Hopefully, if there is a, another government, another president in the United States, the first thing we will do is ask him, ask him for dialogue and his team. Let's sit down. Let's, let's go back to the framework of the international law. Let's respect the Venezuelan constitution. We will respect you, even though we have profound differences. We believe in socialism. You believe, you believe in, in neoliberalism and capitalism. But we can work together, and we can respect each other. We would do that with any Canadian government, even with this government, if they have any kind of reflection of rectification of what they have been doing. So uh, I must also tell you that these sanctions, they have been hard on Venezuela. And uh, it's been four rounds of sanctions. And uh, for instance, no persons in Canada or Canadian persons outside of Canada 
can trade property, carry out some sanctions, some sanctions, provide financial services, work for anyone on the CIMA list, that is this act that they are um, uh, approved in the Canadian Parliament. Likewise, under the Mag Magnitsky Act, people listed have their accounts frozen and they are declared inadmissible to Canadian territory. I remember reading this material that I was sanctioned by Canada. Mm -hmm. I couldn't remember. I didn't remember. <laughs> I was reading for this conference and I, I realized, okay, I was sanctioned by Canada as well and by the US. Why? I have no idea, really. It's just an Larry. aggressive act. Huh? Larry. Yeah, Larry, Larry De Boy, who works for, for the Venezuelan government and is um, in charge of the Council of Human Rights of the Venezuelan uh, state, he who defends the human rights of the Venezuelan people was also sanctioned by the Canadian government. And only people that were elected as members of the National Constituent Assembly were sanctioned because they were elected, because the people voted for them. People that organized them, for, for instance, the uh, National Electoral Council members were sanctioned because they organized an election. They facilitated the Venezuelans their right to vote something that Canada government has stopped and forbid in the 2018 presidential elections. So even some Venezuelan athletes, uh, fencing uh, teams, uh, military athletes that were traveling to Canada for important competition games, um, they were not issued uh, the Canadian visas because they were Venezuelans. I mean, that's really, um, it's a se segregationist, uh, um, racist. Uh, it's it's really I, I never thought that Canadian Canadian any Canadian government could do such a thing. And, and I wanted to share with you. Uh, I insist if the Mr. Champagne of uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada wants to have a conversation with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, I can call him and we can have a telephone phone call right now. If he wants to meet with me in Ottawa, in Caracas, in Mexico City, in Beijing or whatever, I can travel whenever he wants, because we believe that we should respect Canada and Canada should respect Venezuela and not interfere in the Venezuelan internal affairs. And Canada should, if they really want to defend the Venezuelans' human rights, then they should stop um, sanctioning Venezuelans and they should stop supporting the sanctions and the blockade that the United States has imposed to the Venezuelan people. We cannot use the banking system in the world. We cannot buy imports, food or medicine and when we do it with traders and third actors, it is four or five um, um, times much more expensive than if it was directly. We cannot make any trade with Canada, with the United States, which are the main producers of, of uh, everything in this part of the world. Where even our uh, the ships that, the tankers that uh, transportate um, oil from Venezuela are stopped, are persecuted. The Navy companies are persecuted all over uh, to stop uh, transporting oil from Venezuela. Our industry, our, our PDVSA, the, the oil industry in Venezuela is not producing enough because we cannot import the chemicals they need, the drills they need, the spare parts they need. They cannot export their oil. CITGO, which was a, a very important way of, of, of having also income for PDVSA was seized by the US government. So they are trying to strangle the Venezuelan people. So that's why I wanted to read. This is, I didn't bring the book. I forgot the book at home, but I, I printed the, these pages. And uh, it's really important for me to share this. This is a book called or named the Art of Sanctions. It was written by a man, a professor, um, named Richard Nephew. 
Richard nephew used to be the main advisor of, of Barack Obama for the sanctions against Iran. And he studied all this sanction strategy against other countries. And he you know, just very sincerely wrote a book where they undisguise themselves and show themselves openly. So he says you know, that the, region, the general framework of the sanctions, you know, the goals of the sanctions should be, should follow these steps. And he says this more than 10 times over the 230 pages of his book. First, identify the objectives for the imposition of pain. Listen to this, pain, imposition of pain and define minimum necessary remedial steps that the target state must take for pain to be removed. Second, understand as much as possible the nature of the target, including its vulnerabilities, interests, commitments to whatever it did to prompt sanctions and readiness to absorb the pain. So he's confessing that what they do with the sanctions is impose and produce pain on the people. That's really It's, it's not only in breach of this charter, of the charter of the Declaration of Human Rights, of any uh, international treaty. This is in breach of the human nature and it shouldn't be allowed in the international relations. Then they say, the third step, develop a strategy to carefully, method, method, methodically, methodically and efficiently increase pain on those areas that are vulnerabilities while avoiding those that are not. So on the second step, you identify the most um, weak of a society of this uh, country that is uh, object of sanctions and you hit them directly. You try to kill them. You produce pain, disease, uh, suffering. And then you will see if the sanctions are successful or not. Then there is monitor the execution of the strategy and continuously recalibrate its initial assumptions of target state result, the efficacy of the pain applied, the pain applied in shattering that result and how best to improve the strategy. Then they say they have to give these, these countries um, a, a framework of what the minimum steps that they must take in order for the sanction to be removed. That means that I have to surrender. I have to capitulate. I have to do what you want. So I have to uh, tell President Maduro, President Maduro, forget about the 9 million people that voted for you um, and uh, step down because in order for the sanctions to be removed, Juan Guaido and Crystal Lex and the people of uh, the companies, oil companies, Chevron and BP and others are going to rule Venezuela because that's the will of Donald Trump, John Bolton, and the corporative imperialism that wants to rule the world. That's something we would never do. We would never betray the confidence that the Venezuelan people has given the Bolivarian revolution for over 20 years. And there is an aggression to Venezuela, which is political, yes, diplomatic, it's economic with the sanctions, the blockade, with all this trying to strangle the Venezuelan, It is also a media um, uh, aggression, trying to demoralize the Venezuelan people and to make the people believe that we are uh, drug dealers, narco traffickers, uh, we are uh, dictators, tyrants, that we kill the people in the streets if they think differently, that we want to uh, eradicate the opposition. That is all false, that is all lies. That is what they are trying. They are working on their own public opinion to create the conditions, you know, like they did in Panama or they did in, in so many places in Iran against uh, Saddam Hussein and whatever in Libya against Gaddafi, in Syria against Al Assad, create this uh, public opinion uh, um, environment in order to justify whatever attack, aggression, military or not against Venezuela. That is what they are trying to do. And 
our our people is has a high level of awareness of consciousness and uh, we would we defend the venezuelan homeland with missiles with tanks with airplanes with pistols with rifles with knives with sticks with spoons with stones and whatever we find so it wouldn't be easy and many people would die in venezuela and probably our country would be destroyed but maybe the outcome of, of an invasion in venezuela would be even worse than the vietnam war, war because we would know how to resist our uh, bolivarian armed forces know what to do our militia forces which is the reserve of the armed forces know what to do and we each one of us would know what to do. that's not what we want we want our country to be respected our sovereignty to be respected this charter and this constitution charter of the united nations this constitution the declaration universal declaration of human rights to be respected when it comes to venezuela and to let us follow our own path that is all that we want what can we do with canada i don't know but i am sure that they are in breach of international law uh, they have the opportunity always to rectify and to make things better and to sit with us they, there were some meetings of uh, christia freeland with uh, bruno rodriguez the, the minister of foreign affairs of uh, cuba and they wanted to convince cuba to convince maduro to step down that's not what we want Cubans thought that they wanted to use Cuba as, as a bridge with the Venezuelan government. They didn't. They just wanted to use Cuba. And of course, Bruno told them, go away. That's not, we're not even going to discuss this with, with you. There's a government in Venezuela, there's a president in Venezuela. You should respect that government and you should talk to that government. It never happened. So and I'm, I'm going to stop with this. The only occasion, the only time I had to have any kind of exchange with Christia Freeland was in the General Assembly of the OAS. The last General Assembly that, were, that Venezuela attended because we were in the process of uh, uh, retiring from, from the OAS and we had to stay for two years to comply with the OAS charter, although we had already um, officially said that we were going to uh, how do you say to leave to leave there's another expression and uh, that time but well, she had uh, she took the floor she said i don't know how many things about my president my country my government and uh, then i had the time to answer and the first thing i told her that she had a beautiful last name uh, freeland and that venezuela was a free land and that she shouldn't interfere in Venezuelan affairs and that we have had a very um, smooth relationship with Canada historically and that we should recover and resume that kind of, of relation and that they should stop being the uh, slaves of the United States when it came to Venezuela doing what they wanted organizing Lima groups and sang and, and Posing san sanctions against Venezuela, and we should talk. Of course, she almost went, she was hysteric. She said she would never talk to us, that we were dictators and whatever. So I believe that you in Canada, or the social movements, the political parties, um, the universities, the think tanks in Canada, people that really understand uh, the Canadian society, you should press your government not only for your government to respect Venezuela, but to respect the other countries. There, there are many things happening against Nicaragua in Latin America. Uh, many things would happen against any, what, look what happened in Bolivia, a coup d'etat that was planned and funded by the United States. And now they're trying to organize the elections and they have postponed the election once and again because the party of Evo Morales, the mass of Movimiento al Socialismo would win in the first round of those elections. And they are now, they are persecuting, they are saying that Evo Morales, uh, accusing him for, for felony and whatever, because they want him in jail and the candidate, Luis Arce, 
also on the candidate for vice president as well. So that is what the empires do. And I must always remember this. The empire is not the United States. The empire is, of course, not the people of the United States. We respect and we love and admire the people of the United States. The empire goes beyond. It's also countries in Europe, but it's not the countries. It's not the people of Europe. It's not the British people. It's not the Fr French people. It's this set of corporations, of transnational interests, of lucrative corporations to that explode the human beings, the workers, and that, as Eisenhower said, this military industrial complex, it's also financial, technological, they take the decisions in the capitalist world. They tell the governments what to do. That's why Trump became a president. They want to, to be sincere, to, to be very honest about that. Let's put a businessman, a very rich man, because then we are already, um, we, we take the mask and we are already obvious of what we are. So we have to, we have to have this always um, present into account. We have to stop the empire. Imperialism has, has to be stopped. But that doesn't mean a war against the United States. That doesn't mean aggression against Canada. That means that the people should take power through elections through democratic means, and that the people of Canada should decide their own future and not this group, this plut plutocracy, you know, the government of the rich, these oligarchies all over these countries linked to these corporations. So I wanted to stop it here and then, I'm sorry if I, I, it was too long, but I needed to say many things about Canada and to the Canadian people. Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much to the foreign minister. Um, we get such a one-sided perspective here in Canada, and it's critical that people hear directly from you um, and to understand Canada's contribution to the suffering of the Venezuelan people. These are not things that we see in the media. So I thank you for taking the time to offer this perspective on how we're le leveraging our good name the commercial impacts, uh, interests in their impacts on our policies, the diplomatic absurdities that have arisen. And you mentioned dialogue. We at the Institute believe debate is the lifeblood of democracy. And as a bit of a uh, backstory, we actually tried to set up a debate with uh, Vice, Vice Minister Carlos Ron and uh, Venezuelan Special Advisor Alan Cullum. He refused, we approached a few other officials, Bed Roswell, and didn't hear back. So this is actually how this event came to be. So I wanna thank you again for being so generous um, with your time and expression of these concerns. We're now going to call upon journalists. Um, each journalist will have the opportunity to put forward a question. And, um, and then, as I said, if we have time, uh, we'll open up to a few questions from the audience. So first up, I'm gonna call on August Arnold from Telesur English uh, to ask his question. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we hey. can. Thank you very much, uh, Jorge, Minister Jorge Arias, for, for your great uh, presentation. I'd like to deal with one specific question based on what you said and also what uh, Bianca just said, that we in Canada, we want dialogue to take place, in this case between uh, uh, Canada and Venezuela. And on the other hand, Canada has a position, so-called position, for a peaceful transition in Venezuela for democracy in Venezuela. Now, yesterday I wrote an article based on the latest uh, revelations by your ambassador to the United Nations, Samuel Moncada, that apparently there's a military invasion being planned now for October before the November elections. So in this open letter that I wrote, I addressed it to uh, Champagne, to Trudeau, to Christian Phelan, that let us discuss why should Canada be dragged into a war on behalf of Trump. And the opportunity is there for you to come. This forum is a public forum. As far as I know, there's thousands of people participating. And so I asked them, come to this forum today, ask questions, let us discuss 
amongst Canadian people and as well as the official representative of Venezuela in order to avoid this intervention and in order to avoid bloodshed. And I would say to show clearly that you respect our basic norm that we should have a democracy in Canada. After all, we are Canadians. We want our voices to be heard. And our voice is that we do not agree with the Canadian position against Venezuela. So the question is, how would you deal with what, what I'm saying, uh, Minister Ariasa? Ariasa now? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, um, August, thank you so much. And I'm very happy that you told many people to, to connect and to listen to me. Probably I would like to say much more things, but I think I said um, sufficient as to make my point and to let the Canadian people know that their government is attacking Venezuela every single day, you know, when Trump accused, I mean, or when Russia was accused of supporting or intervening in the electoral campaign of, of Trump and all that investigation and all that scandal, because they suppose that Russia, we have been having the US intervention since February the 2nd, 1999, every single day, every single hour. And we have had Canadian intervention for the last five years at least. Every single day, every single week, every single month, every single hour. So that's something that should be taken into account because you did not elect Mr. Trudeau and those political parties in the parliament in order to attack other countries in the name of the Canadian people. When they when when Champagne and others talk about the peaceful transition, what they are referring to is that transition that the opposition has has talked about and has presented, a transition without Maduro, without the Chavismo. So we stepped down, or or you you saw that in April we were accused, not not me, at least not for now, but President Maduro. Uh, Minister Tarek El Aysami, the Minister of Defense, Padrino, the President of the Judiciary System in Venezuela, Michael Moreno, they were accused of being the capos, the, the bosses of a drug cartel. That doesn't exist. I published a book from a Spanish journalist and a researcher, Fernando Casado, about this so-called Cartel de los Soles that doesn't exist. It's a fiction. It was made up by the media, and uh, this, this has no support at all in reality. But this was enough as to the general attorney of the U.S. to accuse President Maduro of being in charge of a drug cartel. So Colombia produces the drug, they grow the coke uh, leaf, they process the drug, and then it goes to Maduro. Maduro sends it to, and we're trying to to, what is it, inundar? To flood. To flood. That's the accusation. Maduro is trying to flood the U.S. with the drugs. And if one of these ministers uh, uh, goes to an airport, to a country that is close to the U.S., then they can probably be detained and imprisoned because of a false accusation. Because they want to make the people of the U.S. and the people of Canada, of Canada and of the world that that there is a gang ruling in Venezuela, that we have no popular support, that the Chavismo doesn't exist, that we have imposed ourselves, that when Chavez died, the Chavismo stopped existing. That's, of course, all false and lies. So the transition and this, the, uh, the government of the US, the Trump administration presented the so-called framework, democratic transition framework, which was this, it's a government without the Chavismo, and, and it's with, with a council, a uh, national, as they say, a state council, which is not in this constitution. There, there is a state council here that is, uh, advises the, the president. It doesn't substitute the president. It doesn't rule. So they want 
uh, Juan Guaidó to be in charge of that council and to rule in Venezuela. What is that? Who said they could do that? Who said they were allowed to, to create laws in Venezuela and to change our constitution and to ignore the popular will of the Venezuelan people when they elected President Maduro? And in fact, there are some rumors. We saw a meeting of Craig Fowler, the Almirant, that is um, the chief of the South Command, you know, the military South Command of the US, of Mr. O'Brien, who is the, the new John Bolton you know, in, the, in the National um, Security Council of the White House, and others with Presidente Duque, which is who is really Presidente Uribe, and he hates the Venezuelan um, uh, revolution, and they are the real capos of the drugs in this continent. And they have military bases of the US where the drug is, uh, grows and when it is, where it's processed and when it's distributed through the Pacific, never through the Caribbean, or at least in very small amounts through the Caribbean. 94% of the Colombian drug gets to the US through the Pacific or through, the, or through uh, planes directly to Central America, flights to Mexico, not through Venezuela or the Venezuelan coasts or the Venezuelan ships. That's absurd. So they met with Duque a couple of days ago and they said they were meeting because of initiative, a new plan Colombia, Colombia Crece, a new plan to invest in Colombia, but they were really planning. And Mr. Duque today said that he had information that Venezuela is trying to buy missiles and um, very sophisticated uh, war technology from Iran and that we also uh, get weapons from uh, Russia and Belarus. <laughs> you know what's happening in Belarus. And that the, those weapons we give to the dissident guerrillas in, in Colombia and that with those weapons, they are killing the social leaders in Colombia. Come on. So that's what they're trying to convince the public opinion. Lies. It's, it's really perverse. You know? And, and uh, this hoax, it's a wink. I don't know. I don't even know if Trump is aware of this, if he's informed of this, if he gave them the order. I don't know, because he's so strange, you know, so unpredictable. But this um, hoax, this wink of hoax, which is not a, uh, of a hawk, but this wink of the right of the hoax in the White House, in the Pentagon, in the State Department, they want to do something whilst they are in power. You know the polls in the United States? You know that it, I don't know what's gonna happen. It's none of my business, but Trump is not in a good position at the moment. He has really handled uh, the pandemic in a catastrophic way, like Bolsonaro here in Brazil, the, almost a genocide, and um, he will probably lose, maybe. So they're trying to accelerate the processes in order to do something before, but that is a group. That is the same group last Bolton. You remember the coup uh, April the 30th last year? That was Bolton's idea, uh, but Bolton is not there anymore. So this group is extremist group, fascist group, is going to try to do something before the elections in the US or before the elections in Venezuela in December. I don't think the conditions are good for that. I think we're in alert. Everything is set in Venezuela to avoid, like we stopped the mercenary incursion um, in, in May uh, with, with American mercenaries, Venezuelan, uh, militaries that had defected and betrayed the Venezuelan constitution and some Colombians, we stopped that because we were, uh, we knew about it. We, we have intelligence uh, processes happening and, and we had information even from militaries from Colombia uh, that gave us some signals of what was going to happen. And we would stop any, any attack and we would respond if we are attacked. We would never attack, but we would, we would of course respond if we are attacked. So that's something that might happen. And I know that if it's going to be a decision of Donald Trump, it's going to be supported by the Canadian government. I hope not. Maybe they can listen to this because I'm sure that I am so sure that 
the, I don't know if the minister, but people from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Canada are listening to this conference, to this uh, exchange, and they are taking note. Hopefully, they rectify and they would never support, not now or in the future, a military operation against Venezuela. Thank you, August. Thank you, August, for your question. Thank you to the foreign minister. The next person that we're going to be receiving a question from is Paul Tamilti from Post Media, uh, the National Post. Uh, hello, Paul. It's actually, it's actually Ryan. It's not Paul. Oh, Ryan, my bad. Um, Welcome, no problem. Ryan. Um, so I wanted to ask um, about um, Minister, you know, uh, millions of Venezuelans ha have fled your country in the past few years, according to reports, and there have been food shortages. How else would, would should Canada have responded to this incident? And I, I'm under, wonder also how you figure you can go forward with so many countries, um, so many of your neighbors of, of having joined the Lima Group and opposing your current government. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. That's an important question. The second question, we go forward with the support of our people. The only uh, actor in this world that has to recognize the Venezuelan institutions is the Venezuelan people. And uh, we have good friends in the world as well. In Latin America, in the Caribbean, Cuba is our main ally. Cuba is working on the vaccine also. You will be surprised by Cuba again. And we have China, Russia, India, Turkey, um, almost all of Africa. And uh, we have Argentina, Mexico that are close to us uh, again. And uh, I mean, we don't depend on, we, don't, we have managed, we have handled this situation with this blockade, criminal blockade. We have uh, um, taken to the International Criminal Court, the government, another government, the, the um, officials of the US government that have signed executive orders or any kind of acts or any kind of sanction against Venezuela. And uh, because our people are dying or are getting sick during this pandemic, they have imposed more sanctions. The, U the United Nations asked the US to flexibilize, to lift the sanctions. Michel Bachelet asked them, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the special rapporteurs from the Human Rights Council, the governments all over the world asked the US to stop um, imposing these sanctions against Venezuela, Iran, Cuba, etc. And what they have done is they have imposed more sanctions. Well, in this situation, we have handled not only to resist, but to advance. So there is, we don't need, we would, we, we would be better off if we, have, if we had neighbors that respected us, that respected our constitution as we respect their constitution. But if they are not with us, we don't care. We have to go on, we have to advance for the welfare of our people. About the, the situation of the Venezuelan migrants, how could you expect after a country has been blocked and has been subject to so many attacks, a multi-dimensional uh, aggression of political, as I said, diplomatic, um, economic, trade, um, energetic against our, our oil ex exports and production. Um, our currency was attacked for many years and it's still attacked. We have an, a high inflation level because of the of these disturbances in our economy. We, we are threatened with invasions. Trump says that he's going to um, attack Venezuela whenever he wants. How could you expect not to have economic migration. Of course we have, but it's not 5 million people. It's not 4 million people. The figures we have is never more than 2 million people. Oh, okay, the, the, the United Nations are saying, oh, it's 5 million people and Colombia says it's 6 million people. And, and when a Venezuelan travels to Colombia and then travels to Ecuador and then travels to Peru and then travels to Chile and then travels to Argentina, when he's in Argentina, no, then they count him five times. 
and they say it's five migrants, not one. So then they have these uh, blasted uh, figures that are not true at all. But we are concerned about this. We want them to come back. I must tell you then that um, since um, probably July of last year to today, 300,000 Venezuelans have returned. And that during the pandemic, more than 80,000 Venezuelans have returned uh, through Colombia. Uh, they, were, they, they are um, running away from discrimination, racist, slavery. They have been even slaves in these countries. And the mismanagement of the pandemic in these countries have made them come back to Venezuela and they are welcome. And we will have, when we have control, absolute control of our economy, when, when these sanctions are lifted or when we learn how to live uh, in, in spite of the sanctions, and we are already learning how to do it, then all these Venezuelans have the right to come back and to have the most powerful economy in this continent. But this is going to take some time. We are concerned about them. We want them to, to come back. We want them to be protected. Millions and millions of dollars have been approved by the European Union, by the United Nations, by the Grupo de Lima. But I don't know one Venezuelan that has told me that he has received a plate of soup or a kind of uh, uh, any kind of subsidize or of, uh, money or whatever, or clothes in Peru, in Colombia, in Ecuador, in Chile, or anywhere. So I don't know what's happening with that money, where it is going. I have no idea. So all that is hypocrisy, I insist, to destabilize Venezuela. This migration was also induced. You know? uh, even president, I remember president of uh, Peru, a uh, very, very corrupt man who was um, ousted by the parliament after some months, um, Kuczynski. He said, oh, the Venezuelans should come to Peru with you because you are suffering this tyranny and whatever. When they received too many Venezuelans, they closed their borders to the Venezuelans. So that's, that is our neighborhood. And we love Latin America, not all of their governments. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Ryan. Um, our next question is from Andre Denise from McLean's Magazine. Andre? Hi there. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation, Minister Adriasa. Uh, a question for you regarding <clears throat> Canadian uh, foreign policy and the uh, the approach that we've taken uh, to recognizing or what they uh, what the uh, the government calls uh, the uh, the rightful president of Venezuela. So the uh, foreign minister uh, Francois Philippe Champagne uh, tweeted a few days ago that uh, Canada, with its international partners, calls for the establishment of a transitional government in Venezuela with a process driven by. Venezuelans. A swift and peaceful transition to democracy is the most sustainable route to stability, recovery, and prosperity. And then uh, tagged uh, Juan Guaido in the post. Now, um, I, I got, my question is for Canadians that may not be familiar uh, with Venezuelan politics and you know just just go buy newspaper headlines. What should they know um, about? Uh, the democratic process that lets the current government and Juan Guaido's place in it. Thank you, Andre. Um, yes, in fact, last Friday, I believe a statement was issued, 31 governments, I must say, not, not, not people, um, signed. It's strange because they say that 60 countries recognize Guaido, but they only had 31 or 32 countries sign, signing, huh? Sub subscribing this statement, supporting it. But in any case, that is um, strategy from the United States because they have failed in everything that they have tried in the, when it comes to Venezuela. So they, are, they continue changing their strategy. So they are trying to press these countries and what they call you know, the so-called international community in order to, in advance, not recognize the parliamentary elections of December the 6th here in Venezuela. So they are already saying it's going, elections cannot be held if Maduro is uh, the president, uh, Maduro is forbidding the, the parties to re register and whatever. The thing is, the 
same Venezuelan opposition that boy boycotted the elections in 2018 are doing the same now. They are not resisting. That's the order they get from Washington. Do not register because then you're going to validate the Maduro regime and the tyranny and whatever. So um, it is important for the Canadian people to know that there is a democracy in Venezuela, that we are here, the Bolivar Revolution and uh, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro and our governors and mayors and the parliamentaries are there because they have been elected by the people in very fair elections with a electoral system that um, many people could empire because it is, uh, it, it is so clear, so transparent. It is accountable, it is auditable uh, by, by many ways and means. So what they should know is that, of course, our democracy is not like the democracy in the United States, only two parties, a plutocracy, the lobbies, you have to have a lot of money in order to become candidate, you have to com compromise and promise things to the uh, companies and their lobbies and to Israel and the Zionist lobby and whatever. No, here in Venezuela, our president used to be a bus driver and he was a trade unionist. And then he was with Chavez, supporting Chavez and being one of his main disciples um, all over uh, the, the governments of the Bolivarian revolution and before. So here in Venezuela, there are many political parties. For this election, more than 100 political parties have been registered. Uh, some of them are local, regional, but many of them, I mean, 50 or more, are national parties and they have registered. Those that have registered is because they don't want to, because they are following uh, the order of the uh, State Department or, or the United States in any case. So we are going to have a new National Assembly finally, because you know, when this assembly, we lost the elections in 2015. We lost it by, by a large uh, difference. And this assembly from the oligarchy, the bourgeois, the, the traditional corrupt parties in Venezuela, which are aligned with the US, they didn't approve one law for the welfare of the Venezuelans. What they did was try from the National Assembly to overthrow President Maduro. And, their first president, because they change every year. They elect a new directive every year, board. And their first president said, we are here because we want Maduro to be out of power in six months. Then we had this conflict with the National Assembly all these five years. They don't represent the, the interest of the people. So we need a real National Assembly. And those parties can participate and we can have uh, maybe we lost again, I don't know, or maybe we win. I think we're going to win because of the conditions and the very bad uh, uh, management or gestion you know, of, this, of this National Assembly. So uh, they want to avoid this from happening. If they participate and the Chavismo win, then they are going to all be, um, you know, they're going to be ridiculed. They're going to be all ridiculed. They're going to be everything. Will everyone can laugh uh, to their face because they have done everything? Because Maduro doesn't even have two percent of uh, the support of the Venezuelan people. That's what they say. And when we win the elections, December the sixth, with or without them participating, this because there's a. I mean, from these parties, I I said one hundred parties, maybe five of them. All the rest of them are from the opposition. No? So that's the real thing. And about Juan Guaido, he's, he used to be the president of the National Assembly until last year that there was a new president elected this January the 5th. He didn't, he self proclaimed himself. Oh, he self proclaimed, sorry, first as president and then as president of the National Assembly when he was not elected as such. And uh, he's just the puppet of the United States. He is in the line of command, you know, from, well, first the corporate uh, decisions, no, the private corporate decision making process, then Trump, then Pence, then Pompeo, O'Brien, uh, before it was Bolton, 
then Marco Rubio and these people from Miami, and then somewhere over there, it's Guaido and, and the, the line of command. You know? uh, that's the chain of command. That's the real issue here in Venezuela. He doesn't represent the Venezuelan people. No one elected him. He's president of nothing of Narnia, as I said, and it is absolutely uh, ridiculous that a, a serious nation, civilized nation, as Canada, uh, was involved in this fake process in order to impose a government in Venezuela. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. So we're, um, we're getting close to the end of our allotted time. So there's a few more journalists. I'm just going to ask that you keep your questions um, as brief as possible. We'd like to get the last few of you in and then we are going to have to end our session. So the next journalist that we're going to hear from is um, Luis Laborda um, from Radio Canada International, CBC. Uh, Luis. Hello, Luis, are you still there? Okay, we're gonna move on to, um, uh, who do we have here? Is um, Camila Escalante here? All right, so I think that that concludes all of our journalists for today. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to everyone for having been here. Um, this was an incredible event, um, a historic event. And, um, you know, I just want to thank both Roger who had to leave um, uh, due to time considerations. It was a great discussion. And I just want us to continue to, you know, to debate these questions, to continue to ask ourselves whether we're willing to accept our government's participation in Trump led regime efforts um, and to think about the impacts that this has on the ability of everyday Venezuelans to thrive. So thanks again to Roger who was gone. Thanks to Foreign Minister Ariadza for your generous presentation. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Thanks to everyone who participated, all the groups who helped co-sponsor and promote, um, our media sponsor, Canadian Dimension, Common Frontier, the Canadian Latin America Alliance. Let's continue to demand better of our country's foreign policy. You can sign our petition for a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy at foreignpolicy.ca. Um, thanks to all of you for, be, for being here. Um, that's our program for today. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you.